KG, yeah. you've been involved in drug rehabilitation for drug addicts for over 23 years. Yeah, but actually, I've been involved officially in drug rehabilitation since 2009. But before then, for 23 years, for some years before 2009, I've been going to drug communities, trying to reach out to them on one-on-one -on -one basis. On How did this start? Why did you start uh, that mission? Yeah, the, the, you know, at times in life, you go through some things because uh, eventually that's probably that is your assignment in life. I was once a drug addict, you know, yeah, and it came to, it came to be uh, through music. I actually was a fellow Nikola Bokuti's keyboard player for 15 years. So my hanging around in Kalakuta Republic got me into drugs. Now, I'm not saying here that fella gave me drugs, but you know where there's music, there will always be drugs. So it's a street oh, thing. Really? Yeah, okay. so it's a street thing. So on the street, apart from India Hem that is quite popular in Kalakuta, someone else introduced me to heroin and cocaine and uh, on and on all the way. So all my tours and travel with Kalakuta all over the United States, North America and Europe, I got introduced to further drugs and all that. And, uh, was an addict for 15 years and so and when supernaturally i got out of it through the power of the saving grace of jesus and i made up my mind uh, i developed this passion to help drug addicts being a drug addict in the past but when you say that you got saved through supernatural intervention can you take us back to the day that you got do you remember what happened on that day of course i remember can you take us back a bit and tell us how it happened yeah actually i was i was getting fed up because um, i was walking i was traveling but i couldn't give account for a single cent that i was making because of drug addiction so and also i wasn't having plans to settle down i mean marry and have children i was just living for drugs drugs and sex so at at a particular point, I, I was getting worried about it, but I didn't really know what to do. But one night, at, at this time, I was hanging out with three prostitutes somewhere in a guest house in Ujueleba. And um, that night, May 7, 1994, I escorted these three prostitutes to Ujueleba roundabout where they took off to where they are going to do their hustle for the night. And I branched a place called Texas where they sell drugs, bought two grams of cocaine and two grams of heroin, got back to the guest house. And I was, as I wanted to, you know, put up, uh, smoke the cocaine, of course I heard a voice from somewhere, I don't know, then, mm -hmm. but I know it, it was a supernatural voice, today I know it's the voice of God, that says clearly, uh, young man, if you don't stop this lifestyle, you're going to die this year. And I've never been afraid all my life, you know, because, uh, I mean, fella told us that um, fear is for man. Mm -hmm. uh, fear is not for man, it's good that run. So I ignored the voice and I went ahead to take the heat. And when I inhaled the smoke, something happened that is too bad for drug addiction, that I've seen kill somebody before where we were smoking. I vomited blood. So when that fear gripped me, that was when I stood in that room and I was wondering, and then another supernatural thing that happened is that something like a TV screen appeared before me, and I saw me right from the day I ran away from home, and went to Kalakuta Republic till that night, all that have happened. And by the time that screen disappeared, I was, in, I was covered with tears and cut. I was weeping over my life. And that was the turning point. I just said to myself, man, but I didn't know what to pray. But somehow I just said, you this Jesus that you're always talking about, if it is true, you can save. Only one thing I want you to do for me, if you can deliver me from drug addiction, I will serve you all days of my life. You know what? Yeah. He did. A few months ago, mm. right, I took a poll in a teenage class that I teach every Sunday. That's right. And it revealed to me that 37.5% of them had taken drugs at one point in time. That's not shocking. It's not? It's not. Why? Because that's, exact, that's not exactly the figure if you go into proper research. In Nigeria? Yeah. What's the figure? It's between 50 and 55%. Have taken drugs before? At one point or the other. What age? 12, 13, 14, from my visiting uh, secondary schools all over Lagos, I always take the poll. I just ask if you have tasted it once or twice. Put up your hands, 50, 
But why? Why? Why um, is the use of drugs popular amongst young people? Well, because one, the drug trend has moved from what we call uh, strict drugs to prescription drugs. And so young people can now hide under prescription drugs because street drugs have their odor and they carry a lot of uh, paraphernalia with them. But when it comes to prescription drugs, there's nothing involved. It's just pills and tablets and, uh, and liquid. So when you say street drugs, what do you mean? Yeah, I'm talking about narcotics like cocaine, okay. heroin, um, ashish, LSD, and the likes. So that's not what they're taking? No, no, no. That's, uh, that's becoming old school now. Okay. Yeah, it's becoming old school. So the, what is new school? The, the new school for the young people is prescri prescription drugs. Like? Coding. Oh, yeah. Do you, you know why, why, I'm sorry, I, I really have to come in there. I was talking, because I'd spoken with you a few weeks ago. That's right? right. And I spoke with my cousin, who is 15. Okay. He's in a secondary school in Nigeria, oh. a Christian secondary school. That's right. And I just said, let me just even ask him. And he said, yes, he had been offered codeine. Now, I said, did you take it? He said, no, because I had exams. I said, if you didn't have exams, would you have taken it? He said, yeah. I hear it makes me feel good. I would have taken it. Yeah, that is the trick that we always say. that uh, The first trick they pull on young people is that when you take drugs, you feel good. Or if you take drugs, it makes you relax. Or if you take drugs, it makes you sleep. So a couple of young people I've spoken to when they had one crisis or the other, maybe parental crisis at home and all that, or maybe their lover just jilted them and, you know, they get trouble, they can't sleep. A friend just tell them, why don't you take codeine? Okay. And on and on. And of course, not just codeine. There are other drugs they are trying on, like Tramadol. We have Sanax, you know, Librom, Activan, and several. Oh, wow. Um, now, when I did this poll, when I took the poll, I, I was still shocked, even though you're telling me now that the stats I even got was even low. And I asked them a question. I said, where do you buy these drugs? And they said, almost in a chorus form, everywhere. Sure. And then when I, I was like, what do you guys mean by everywhere? And they said, Antilabo, it's available everywhere. It's everywhere. It's in the clubs, it's in the bars, people sell it in school. It's everywhere. It's available everywhere. They are not lying. You know, the cheapest place to get them is the Malams that sell cigarettes. They are the one in charge of Tramadol. But now, the question I have for you, though, is it's a pain reliever, right? Of course. It makes you feel good. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's a pain reliever. It makes you feel good. So why would you tell me not to take it? When cocaine was first discovered, it was discovered as an anesthesia. That's a painkiller. So generally, painkillers carry with them a substance that can intoxicate you and make you have this euphoria. And so it's quite easy when these kids find out that what they will get from cocaine, they can get it from a, prescri a prescription drug. So they just go all the way. Now, um, I think, you know, and this is of course my opinion, I, I'm of the opinion that some people will find this funny because um, for them, it makes them work faster. Mm -hmm. It makes them work Better. Like the tramadol, that's yes. why they claim. I was speaking to the Malam yesterday. I said, Why do you take it? He said, It makes him work hard and tirelessly. Mm -hmm. And of course, but then the side effects, those are the things we look at. Okay. Like exhaustion, okay. Like at a point, something that was making you sleep before now starts causing insomnia over time. And then there are other things like seizures, stomach cramps. You know, all this come along with it. But we see on television, so we see entertainers sing about smoking weed. We see how successful they are. Mm. We see people, even people who wear suits. Mm. So like, you know, people who go and sniff all sorts of things during break. I've seen this a few times mm. when I've worked in a financial institution. That's right. And I mean, they find it funny because, I mean, here you are saying it's having this adverse effect. Mm. But there they are. They're having a ball. People are having a great time. People are making money. People are making music. Mm. People are working faster. Mm. So why not? All right. Um, this is what I have to say. You see, um, when, you, when you take off um, experimenting on drug, at first, to the one using drug, it's like you're taking it for pleasure. But eventually, it becomes a health problem. If you go to uh, drug communities uh, very early in the morning, you hear all of them saying, I want to go and cure. I want to go and cure. That's when the drug um, experiment experimentation has moved from pleasure 
to health issues. All right, I want to agree with you that you see musicians using drugs and all that. Another, another uh, false, uh, whatever, belief is that um, there are certain artists that have what we call st stage fright. Okay, yes. Now, now, you know, and these drugs kind of give you fake boldness. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. It gives this kind of fake boldness. And again, I was doing a research on drug and spiritism. Okay, it's also possible that some of them, they do these drugs and like some of them will say, it inspires me. Because you take this drug and then somehow you trip off, and you start to hear some abstract sound. And if you know how to score music, you are able to write out a bass line or a rhythm line and all that. So you feel good that this thing is helping me to write music. But over time, such people can either go bankrupt or get involved with uh, uh, drug-related crimes like uh, rape or whatever. We have seen happen to a lot of entertainers. Okay, and then in, inability to have a stable home because when you are on drugs, you don't think normally, you don't see things normal. Okay. okay, so your life doesn't go the right way that normal people's life go, like maintaining a normal home, marriage, being able to take care of your wife and children, all that. All these are all adverse effects. Then going bankrupt because drug addiction also takes you into a wild lifestyle. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, and then uh, it gets to a point also where the same drug that gives you inspiration now starts demotivating you instead of motivating you. A, you, a young boy was telling me that I, when I want to have sex, I take tramadol. You know, so different reasons why people take drugs. So essentially, and then take, some okay. just to rebel, right. just to rebel. You know, maybe the parents have been hard on him now. He feels I've grown up. I want to show them that I can be a man of my own. And you know, the moment you find out that your son, maybe he's 22, 23, has started smoking, you become cautious. Oh, but 22 is late. If people have started since 13. Oh, that's what I'm saying. But how many parents discover when they are doing it at 12, 13, 14, 15? That's why uh, it's essentially necessary that you get professionals like us to make you know. What are the symptoms? How do you know? Yeah, so what are the symptoms? How do I know, for example, that... A teenager in my class is taking drugs. What are the signs that I need? Number one, bloodshot eyes. Okay. Number two, sleeping uncontrollably. Number three, dress code. If you see a guy, a young man that likes wearing t-shirts that, that carry logos of drug. Okay. So there's an attraction. There's an attraction. Number four, if anytime you are talking about drug is bad and all that, and this guy starts telling you that, what about so, so so person and he's mentioning stars and all that, you know he's been influenced already by stars. You know, most of these stars, they keep rapping about these drugs. Mm -hmm. Then another thing is uh, a child that used to be um, like sitting with the whole family in the sitting room, mm -hmm. now suddenly starts withdrawing from, you know, he goes out, as soon as he comes in, he just walked past everybody in his room and hi dad, hi mom, straight to his room, closed his door, start isolating himself, and then there's a switch, change of friends, and now self is trying to make his new friends, he makes them, um, he keeps them in secret, he doesn't want you to know them. These are all the symptoms. And then if he's doing narcotics, of course, which are expensive drugs, you know what I'm saying, he starts stealing. You know, you, when you notice that some jewelry start missing at home, like wristwatches, mm -hmm. uh, uh, rings, um, earrings, gold, you know, and uh, you, know, you know that somebody doing drugs. And then when you visit the first aid box in the house mm -hmm. and discover that um, uh, uh, drugs like uh, Benilin with codeine and all that, they are, they are depreciating so fast, they get finished on time, you know that there's a child in the house abusing drugs. There are different slangs mm. that... We call them street use. names. Okay, street names. Yeah, they have street right, names. That um, young people use to code the names of drugs. So, for example, in your book mm. that you have just written, I saw Wee Wee. Yeah, Wee Wee. So, because when I see Wee Wee, the first thing I think of is you want to... Pee. Exactly. No. So, I mean, I will not be able to... So, what else, what are, which other names should we watch out for? Oh, so many of them. On the phone and in the, so in the Hajabata level, when you hear Mary Jane, they are talking about marijuana. 
Okay. When you hear Charlie, you're talking about cocaine. Okay. When you hear flicks, you're talking about cocaine. Even though there's a, a presently there's a new prescription drug that was discovered May last year in the United States called Flicker. Okay? It just came into Nigeria last month. Okay? Then we have uh, crack, we have coke, as in Coca Cola, mm -hmm. coke, but that's for cocaine. Then we have uh, atike, or they can call it powder. That's heroin, brown sugar. NNG, Fela coined that. Nigerian National Grass, that's marijuana. Okay. Then we have Poli. You hear that from the mouth of Two Faced Dibia? That is marijuana. Okay. You know, and several other. Okay. I can, I, I, uh, okay. you know. But the thing is, so how do you go about? So how do you go about helping people come out of their drug addiction? When I got out of drugs, it was clear that I can no longer go to shrine. To play and it's only music i know to do so that side was packed up so this was a new passion going after drug addicts so you find me in drug communities places like empire akala you know just going around the diaraba you know and um uh, at the point after about 12 years one day i had the opportunity to preach um, in one church a redeemed church actually and as i was preaching somewhere along the line it just occurred to me that the church He's not doing anything about this stuff. And, you know, our children are out there in the street. Like, uh, you know, the, the drugs is everywhere. So if you think you see that in church, you don't care about the street. So I just mentioned it briefly, and I started telling them that, look, if I leave this altar now, I'll be going to Kalakuta Republic for evangelism. And there's a place called Akala Mushin that I go every Thursday. I mean, every three times a week and all that. That is divided into segments. There's a segment where they sell grass packed in bags, and there's a segment where they sell narcotics and all that. And then um, I think they actually thought I was making up the story. Mm -hmm. So later on, I got a phone call from the pastor, who happens to be my boss in House of Joy. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. And uh, she said to me, she would like to follow me to that place. I said, no problem. So we went there, and uh, the first joint I took out, we saw 23 girls. The, the oldest was 16, five of them were pregnant, and they were all holding a stick of marijuana. And, uh, you know, she was shaking with, you know, I don't, I don't know, she was troubled. And she asked me, what, what, how long have you been coming here? I said, for 12 years. And she asked me, what's your result? I said, well, my result is minimal. She said, why? I said, because funds. And then she asked me, if you have the fund, what would you really like to do? I say there's what we call rehabilitation. It involves getting a property and turning it to a dormitory and whatever, and a lecture room or whatever. And then you bring the drug addicts, you relocate them from the drug community to there, and then help them through natural detoxification, and then let them learn skill and all that. That was how, before I knew it, one day she called me and said um, that there's a property that we, uh, she wants me to see, and we came here together. And that was how this property was bought. It's a redeemed Christian Church of God, anyway. Yeah. yeah, they bought the property, and since then, we've been running this place since 2009. We have we've been able to rehabilitate about 120 drug addicts since 2009. We started as a 30 bed capacity, but it's now for the five bed capacity. Okay. Drug abuse not only affects the individual; it also affects the family and society because it's an instigating factor behind terrorism, armed robbery, and rape. Let's ensure that we're brothers keepers so that we can create a safe society that we can all live in.